contract, which is a good thing. Last Wednesday, so we'll try to get back down where we were here and and uh, try to. Uh, you know, uh, we started. We talking about Calvin, which is a big thing. Um, Frenchman, Calvin was French. Uh, he was a uh, pretty harsh guy, actually. Uh, very intelligent. He was uh, very involved in the government of uh, Geneva, where he was. Very involved in that. He uh, pretty harsh individual. Can't really get into a lot of his history. You can read that. But he came up with this, this acronym we talked about last uh, week, TULIP. Uh, the idea of, uh, you know, basically predestination. And, you know, I think I need to take a minute and kind of play devil's advocate a little bit. Uh, you know, the truth is, these guys are really intelligent guys. All these reformers were. They were top of the. They were top of the block. I mean, these weren't ignorant, backwards people. These were, you know, Luther, uh, Zwingli, um, Calvin, which is the main ones I focus on because it really has more to do with us. There were a lot of other reformers, but these three guys were kind of at the start of the crux, and most everybody else kind of flowed out of them, if you really. And Calvin's so influential to us because Calvin. One of Calvin's kind of disciples, if you want to call it, was a man named John Knox. And John Knox was turned out to be the big Presbyterian, and we'll get into that later on. So, but they weren't stupid guys. So when they came up with these doctrines, it wasn't like they didn't know the Bible. So you kind of have to ask yourself, you know, are they right? Right? I mean, that's a good question to ask. You know, are they right? You know? Because there are scriptures, reasons that predestination can make sense if you want to go down that avenue. And so you have to kind of ask yourself, you know, well, is there such a thing? Predestination. Is God predestined things? A lot of Christians believe that. You even hear it at funerals a lot of times. You'll hear, well, this was God's plan, or that was God's plan. I think it's one of the worst things you can possibly say to somebody at a funeral, but that's just me. Um, so if a little child dies or somebody gets killed or something tragic happens, sometimes Christians find comfort in the idea that it's part of a grand master scheme, that even though that happened, there's, it's part of the plan, Right? So, is that true or not, you know? Um, you know, there's a scripture that you know well, Romans 8, 28. Most all of you know that scripture. You might not know it by that number, but you know what it means. It says, all things work together for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28, very popular scripture. We love that scripture, right? But if you really look at Romans 8 and Romans 9, um, you kind of get the idea, depending on how you read that. Romans eight twenty eight. we know that God calls all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become to conform to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, that sounds pretty much like predestination, right? Right? Let's just be honest, the reading of the passage. And the truth is, he does call. Who does God call, according to the Bible? Who does God call? Yeah, he calls who, though? How many? He calls everybody, right? The Bible's real plain about that. God's long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all, the Bible says, that all should come to repentance. So the call is to everyone, right? Now, everybody doesn't answer the call, obviously, but the call is to everyone. And the best way I know to tell you to deal with 
passages like Romans 8, Romans 9. The best way I know to tell you to deal with those passages is really a pretty simple thought. And actually, I kind of stole this from Red Coleman many, many years ago. You know, those of you all that know Red. But, you know, God predestined the plan and not the man. And I think that's the best way I know to explain God's purpose to you. God predestined the, pl the plan. The plan is predestined. If you do what God tells you to do, if you're obedient to the word, you will go to heaven. That's the plan of God. But whether you choose to do that or not do it, inevitably becomes your decision. But a lot of reformers didn't see it that way. Why? A really valid question. Why? Why do we look at it, or I look at it differently than they do? Who's right? Because it can't both be right. Both these things can't be right. You can't have total predestination and free will. Those things do not jive together. Those both cannot be right. And I think there's a lot of reasons why they came to the conclusions that they came to. And a lot of it had to do with what they came out of. You know, you can never get rid of your past. And these guys were directly influenced by Church of England, Catholicism. They grew up. Calvin was a, Calvin had another church before he went off on his own. You know, Calvin was, these guys came up underneath a teaching. And inevitably, when you do that, you lean towards that teaching. You tend to do that. And at that point in history, this was a thought for a lot of reasons, a lot of reasons. Even the kings of England, their theory was they were predestined to do that. They were God-chosen, right? In other words, it was a God thing. They were godly chosen to lead. So there was a lot of thought. But what happens is, is when this thought begins to come to fruition, as it did with Calvin, because Calvin was a very prolific writer extremely prolific writer he wrote this treatise and it was 20 chapters 15 18 chapters 20 chapters and then he was revising that when they thought he was going to die so he hurried up and finished it and when he got done it was 80 chapters so calvin was a very prolific writer and these writings circulated these writings became doctrinal these writings became almost to an inspired level. People begin to follow, to think, to... And a lot of the guys who did that influenced where we are now. So, I think... You see, there's a difference between Reformation and Restoration. We're not to Restoration yet. We're still in Reformation right now, right? There's a big difference in that. We'll talk about that. But we're still in this Reformation stage. So they were... In that, and John Knox, the Presbyterian influence of Calvin was huge, huge. And that's going to play so heavily into us um, where we are. That influence is going to play into that. Uh, he had a very predominant base of doctrine. And I'm going to tell you, at the time of Calvin, the argument between reformers was not predestination. It wasn't instrumental music. It wasn't any of those things. The argument between reformers at the time of Reformation, at the time of Calvin and Luther and Zwigli and all those guys, the, the argument, the biggest arguments that existed were the Eucharist and the Trinity. Those were the biggest arguments that existed at this particular point in history. That's what they disagreed upon more than anything. Lord's Supper, Eucharist. Well, that's not even an issue yet. Yeah, I mean, the Anabaptist under Zwigli, that Anabaptist movement, but still, not really an issue. Petio Baptist, even the people who rebaptized adults really didn't think there was anything wrong with baptizing the kids. So, Petio Baptism, we're, we're a ways from that becoming a thing yet. It's not really a thing. Uh, baptism by immersion is not really a thing. Sprinkle, pour, wipe. That wasn't really the issue either. You got to remember, under Calvin's theory of doctrine, baptism doesn't really carry any weight anyway, because if you're predestined to be saved, then what's the point of baptism? You see, you understand what I'm saying? There's, 
there's no real point in it. If you're, if you're already predestined to be saved, what's the point of baptism? You know, it's, basically it's a non-issue. Whether you're baptized, you're baptized into a, into a church, into a doctrine, into a denomination, but not into Christ. Absolutely, 139th Psalm. That's right, and that's a real 139th Psalm. David says he saw mother's womb. All my days were numbered. Um, a lot of scriptures point towards that idea. You know, the best way I can tell you is this. God, what God, let's try to back up on this a little bit. God knows everything, right? Does God know who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost? Absolutely. Does God make that happen? No. There's a big difference between foreknowledge and predestination. I want to give you the best example I can give you here tonight. You know, if you've got, ever had a child, right, and your child climbs up on the back of a bar stool, you pretty well know how that's going to end. Am I right? They're going to tip that thing over, fall and bust their head. I mean, that's just what's going to happen. You know, I'm not going to make it happen, but I can tell you that's what's going to happen. Right? There's a big difference in that idea with God. Does God, can God, can God know if he wants to know? Absolutely. Does God want to know? I don't even know. I don't even know that he wants to know. The point of it is God doesn't force us into our path. We, we, we have a path. God can know what we're going to do. But also I think we overstep that. Now let me, let me back this up a little bit. Um, okay, so you got Hezekiah. Let's go to Hezekiah, right? So Hezekiah is a good king, one of the few good kings of, of Israel, um, one of the few, right? And so Hezekiah, he, the prophet comes to him, Isaiah, right? Isaiah is uh, Hezekiah's prophet, which is, that's a big name. He had a big name prophet, right? So Isaiah comes to Hezekiah and says, set your house in order, you're going to die. Right? Remember that story? Set your house in order, you're going to die. Hezekiah turns to him, weeps, and says, God, you know I've been a good king. You know I've done all this stuff for you. I don't want to. And so before Isaiah gets out of the court, he comes back to Hezekiah, and he says, God's going to give you 15 more years. Right? So did God change his mind? Yeah. So the future, even biblically, is not set in stone. Moses, I'll give you another, I'll give you really three good examples. Moses was in the land of Midian. God calls to him from a burning bush. Moses gets to pour his wife, his kids, heads back to the land of Egypt, going to argue with Pharaoh. He's on the way back. If you read that text, when he's on the way back, the Lord meets him and is going to kill him on the way. So after the Lord says, Moses, come out, of Mid come, come out of the land of Midian. I know every time I say this, people go, you're wrong, Rex. That's not in there. Read it for yourself. It's in there. And he says, and he says, last time I said this, somebody called me. It's not in there. Read it for yourself. It's in there. Anyway, so he's on the way back. And, Mo, and God, so after God goes to all that trouble and calls Moses back to Egypt, God's going to kill him. Right? Did God change his mind? Absolutely. And then what happens? Zipporah, she circumcises the men and says, now I'm a wife of blood to him. And God relents. And God says, okay, Moses, go ahead and go to Egypt. You're going to lead my people out. And Moses goes to Egypt, does his thing. Did God change his mind? Absolutely. Right? So God takes the children of Israel up to the mount. They, built, they make the golden calf. They defy God. Moses comes down, breaks the tablet. God says, Moses, you take these people with you to the land that I promised you, and I'll send the angel of the Lord before you to drive out the Hamorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Jebusite, and I'm going to give you the land, but I won't go with you, right? Because perhaps I will destroy them along the way, and I would rather destroy them. I'm kind of taking a little paraphrase of the text, but God says, I'll destroy them, and I'll make you a nation, right? That's what he tells Moses. He says, I'll make you a nation to serve me, and I'll destroy them because they're disobedient. Did God change his mind? Absolutely. So to think that things are set in stone, even biblically, to think that things are set in this pattern that can't be broken is wrong. 
Because biblically, that's not the case. God does relent. God does change his mind. God might be changing his mind right now, for all I know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that's why Jesus hasn't come already, because God said, well, I'll give him a while longer. I don't know. So, can God choose to know things? Sure. But does God make things happen? No, he doesn't. I guarantee you, when God put Adam and Eve in the garden and put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden, God knew they were going to eat of that. Do you agree with me? God knew they were going to do it. You think? But did God make her? No. She did that all on her own. So there's a big difference between foreknowledge and God's knowledge and predestination. Big difference. Big leap. And does God, can God know my days? Absolutely. Can God know what I'm going to do? Sure, he's God. He can if he wants to know. Can I change God's mind? The Bible says I can. I mean, if you read the scripture, why do we pray? If we can't change things, if we can't change the mind of God, then why do we pray? Why do we pray for sick people if we can't change the mind of God? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right, but we pray to intercede to God so that God will intercede on our behalf, so that God will change something. So is it a conundrum? No, not really. Are there people in the Bible that were predestined? Absolutely, absolutely. John the Baptist, no doubt in my mind, John the Baptist is predestined. John, hello? Right, he predestined us, those he called for good works in him, right. Absolutely. What about Pharaoh? Was he predestined or not? Or was he just a, did he just have that heart? Romans 9. Three times it says Pharaoh hardened his heart, and three times it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Right? The big discussion of Pharaoh. Romans 9. Can God choose to raise up a vessel for honor and a vessel for refuse? Does the potter have right over the clay? I mean, does the clay have a right over the potter? Right. The clay went bad in the potter's hand. Yeah. So what I'm saying, I guess, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Right. Trials will produce perseverance, and that produces greater faith. Right. But the truth of it is, is that we are creatures of free will. I believe that with all my heart. <laughs> right. Right. Well, absolutely, it's within us to decide. You know, if pride and arrogance gets in our way, then absolutely. But we still have to make a decision. We had to make a decision to be here tonight. God didn't make you be here tonight. You made a decision to be here tonight. And I believe that. I don't think that, I just don't think every wind that blows and every blade of grass that dies is predestined by God. I just don't think the Scripture backs that up. In the, in the overall view of Scripture, it doesn't back that up. And one thing, Scripture cannot contradict itself. Right? So you can't have two different avenues here. you got to pick one. You know, either everything's predestined and we're all predestined to whatever, or, we're, or we have free will, and there are instances of predestination in the Bible. Was Jesus Christ predestined to go to the cross? 
Was he predestined to be born when he was born? Absolutely, that had to happen. There are things that God says, yes, this is going to happen. Right. Yeah. And I think another thing, you know, I think one thing, like you said, one scripture we tend to gravitate towards when we do this is the 139th Psalm. And I love the 139th Psalm. And, uh, you know, that he knit me in the depths of the earth and saw my unformed substance, that he knows my days and but you got to remember that he's a psalmist. You know, David's a psalmist. He's not, and sometimes I think to take psalms verbatim literally is probably a misuse of context. I think psalms, psalms are different. It's poetry, it's music, it's, you know, the psalms were all set to music originally. They were musical, they were, they're poetry. And a lot of times I think when you look at the psalms, you have to look at, kind of the intent of the passage, more than you have to take every little piece, oh, that has to be this way, and that has to be this way. You kind of got to look at that whole intent. And to me, the intent of the 139th Psalm, and you can, if, you, if you don't know the 139th Psalm, take time to read it. It's, it's, probably, I, it's my favorite psalm, one of the greatest psalms in the Bible. But to me, the intent of the 139th Psalm is the unwavering presence of God in your life. You know, I think that's what the poetry, that's what the psalmist was trying to bring forth, is that, you know, God does love you. God's around you. You can't flee from him. You can't, where can I flee from his presence? Or, you know, I can't, right? Yeah. Right. But yet David made some But I think David made some really bad choices. I don't think he was predestined to go with Bathsheba or predestined to number Israel or predestined to do all those things that he did. In the well, more or less, yeah, for us, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Then he would have been Joshua. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right, and that's another thing you always got to look at with Scripture is, you know, is this apply to me, or is this is this a general is just a general thing? Does this apply to everyone, or is this just something that specifically was applied to that person that that was written to? Right, so that's something else you always got to look at. I guess the point I'm trying to make is don't judge these guys so harshly. You know, they're not stupid guys, and I think sometimes when we talk about them, and I'm bad about that, I talk down about them. And I was thinking that this evening when Buck was talking about being positive. And, you know, I, I, and I talk down about these guys a lot and kind of berate them for a lot. I mean, I shouldn't, you know, because the truth is I have a tremendous amount of respect for what they did when they did it. Right, and I've got the benefit of looking back centuries later and saying, okay, maybe I don't agree with that. But I didn't live in their world. Yeah. Yeah.
if he chooses to. Well, that's what you pray for. I mean, your life is infinite, has infinite possibilities, basically. Every decision you make affects other decisions. Right. Who you, right. But that's why you pray, because you want to make those right decisions. You want to put the right people in your life. You want to go down the path God wants you to go down. Do people always go down the path God wants them to go down? Absolutely not. Well, I think it depends on, I think when you pray to God, you're wanting the best outcome. You're wanting him to make, help you make the right decisions. He's, you're wanting him to influence what he can see tomorrow. You're wanting him to make your tomorrow the best it can be. You're, that's what we pray for. We pray for the providence of God to work in our lives to help us to do the right things, right? We pray for safety. We pray for God to keep us safe. We pray for him to make the decisions to keep ourselves safe. Don't we? I mean, isn't that why we pray? Because we're looking for God's guidance for tomorrow and the next day and the next year. And that's why we pray. That's why I prayed for my kids to find the right husbands all those years because I was praying in advance because I wanted that to happen. I, did that happen? I believe it did in my life. So, so you know, we pray for that. And that, so I think, you know, when we get into this, we get into, you know, it's hard stuff. People argue about this. Hard theological discussions. I'm not saying that it's easy. It's not. It's not easy to understand. We all struggle with decisions we make, paths we choose, things we do. We all struggle with those ideas. And um, it's sometimes people like to rest on that idea that everything's planned, and, and there's comfort in that, isn't it? There's peace in that, in a way. Doesn't matter what happens, right? God planned it. There's a little bit of peace in that idea, but... It's just not right, because that's not how God works. God made us free will people. Eve had a choice. David, I believe, had a choice of Bathsheba, whether to sin or not. I think David made a decision, was it, and it was the wrong decision. You know, if we always made the right, if we always, if God's will was always accomplished, then I would say yes, that was predestined. But let's think about that for a minute. God wants everyone to be saved. Isn't that what the scripture said? He wants all to come to repent. So if God's will was always done, then everybody would just be saved. But they're not. The Bible clearly says that more people will be lost. God's will isn't always done. So, you know, in my, in my mind, I have to believe we live in a very, very flawed world with a whole lot of problems. And I think people die when they're young because we live in a flawed world with a whole lot of problems. I don't think God wills a baby to die or a child to die. I don't believe that. I can't believe that. I physically cannot make myself believe that because for me to believe that, it puts me believing in a God that basically is unjust and has no mercy, and I don't believe in that God. I think we live in a very flawed world, and I think the world's getting more flawed as we go, and I think we pay a price for that in our lives, every one of us, and I don't think you can avoid it because I believe we live in a flawed world. We live in a world of death. We live in a world of disease. We live in a world of everything else that's going on around us. I can't fix that. God could fix it, but let's face it. God's the one who chose to let us go this way. God's the one who put it this way so that you and I would long for something better. Am I right? No, we don't. That's why we have faith, because we can't see tomorrow. We can't assume that. You're right. Um, but I believe that a lot of things happen because they just happen.
Yeah. It's difficult. We struggle. I mean, I struggle with some of these same principles. You have to. I, mean, I think it's human nature. We have to ask questions. We have to ask why. Why does this happen? Why does this tragic thing happen? And I think a lot of people say, well, because it was part of a grand, bigger plan, and God knows tomorrow, and God knew that's what it needed to happen. But on the other hand, I think sometimes bad things happen because bad things just happen. Yeah. So I, you know, I, in my life, I, that's the only way I can uh, make it through my life. I mean, I can't, I don't have another plan. I, don't, I can't take it another direction with what's going on in my life. I just can't. You know, I have to believe in my mind that there's evil in the world, that we live in a flawed world, and a lot of the evil and the bad things that happen happen because of the world we live in. And I think when you read, to me, Romans 8, it says all things work together for good, but it doesn't say all things are good. It says God's going to work it out in the end, and that's my faith, is that at the end, it's going to be okay. That's my faith. You know, because i got to tell you, I've had some pretty dark days in my life, you know, and I, and my faith is, is that even though, my faith has never been, in the dark, in my dark days, if that was God's will for me to have a dark day or God's will for something tragic to happen, my faith has always been that in the end, God's going to make all this right. That's my faith. Me. That's the way I see it. I have to believe that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, we have to have faith that this is going to equalize out in the end, that God's a just God and a righteous God, and this is going to equalize out. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's exactly what their thought was. Who's going to be saved? Who's not going to be saved? That was Calvin's thought, predestination. And because of that, that's why we got this theory of visible manifestation of saving grace. That's a whole lot of words to say that if you're predestined to be saved, somehow you've got to know it, and that's either going to be by working with the Holy Spirit or a conversion experience, and you need to recant that, and people need to decide if you're really saved or not. And I want to tell you, Calvin wrestled with that because he wondered if he was really saved at the end of the day. Because if he couldn't affect it, and he was predestined not to be saved, regardless of what he did, he was lost. So Calvin went to his grave, struggling with the very same question. How do you know? If you're predestined to be saved, how do you know? So, this isn't, it wasn't easy for him necessarily either. Voltaire wrote about Calvin, Luther, and Zwigli, which are the three we looked at, he says, if they condemn celibacy in the priests and open the gates of the convents, it was only to turn all society into a convent. Um, shows and entertainment were expressly forbidden by their religion, and for more than 200 years there was not a single musical instrument allowed in the city of Geneva. They condemned auricular confession, but they enjoined a public one, and in Switzerland, Scotland, and Geneva it was performed the same as penance. In other words, public confession was performed the same as penance, is basically what he's saying there. They struggled with, they, instrumental music was not an issue for hundreds of years. It just didn't exist in the Reformed Church. It just didn't exist. It was a form of idolatry, and they didn't have any place for it. It just didn't exist. Not only that, they wanted to distance themselves as far as they could from Catholicism, as far as they could from the Church of England, and that still carries forward today. And so that's exactly what they did. 
because they wanted to distance themselves. They wanted to be different. They wanted to look different. They wanted to be different. They didn't want people to come in and say, oh, this is a Catholic, or this is the Church of England, or this is that. They wanted to be separate, and so they were very uh, penitent. They did, there's no instrumental music, no vestments, uh, stuff like that was all put to the side because they were trying to distance themselves from Catholicism, and we'll talk about that more as we go through this because that was their thrust, was to get past that. And then I'm going to skip a few centuries, actually, and we're going to start talking about the Great Awakening. And that's this country, really. Uh... Joseph Tracy, the minister, historian, and preacher who gave the religious phenomenon its name in his influential 1842 book, The Great Awakening, saw the first Great Awakening as a precursor to the American Revolution. And we're going to spend some time talking about the Revolution and the Civil War. Um, so what he means with this Great Awakening is, you know, if you look at Pentecostal, you know, um, Tongues and gifts, you know, that's a century old. I mean, that didn't exist for a long, long, long time. Great awakenings are where these things sprung from. LDS, Mormons, uh, Jehovah Witness, um, Shakers, uh, all these sprung out of these great awakenings. It's these times in history where things changed phenomenally religiously. And I don't really know that you can say there were four. I definitely think you can say there's three. In 1720, which is before this book, leaders of the awakening, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, had little interest in merely engaging parishioners' minds. This is the start of Pentecostal, um, started the idea of gifts of the Spirit, speaking in tongues. This didn't exist for centuries, centuries, millennia, right? All the stuff that you see religiously is pretty new in the United States. I mean, pretty new in the scope of history. Uh, they wanted an emotional response, one which might yield the workings and evidence of saving grace. It goes right back to Calvin, manifestation of saving grace. They also wanted to see people who are noticeably moved in the audience and stood out amongst the rest. So this is the start, what we call the first great awakening. Church was real stoic. Priests did their thing. Parishioners did their thing. If you've ever been to Mass. Um, and preachers started wanting to elicit my emotion. They wanted to see an emotional response. They wanted to see, if you want to say it that way, they wanted to see the Spirit in people. They wanted to see this manifestation of saving grace occur. So they started making it, they started making services to try to, fit people into that mold. And so it started out with this mourner's bench at the front of the auditorium, this mourner's bench. And so people would come down to the mourner's bench and they would wail and they would pray and they would, they wanted that. And they preached their sermons to elicit that in the audience. They wanted to stir people emotionally, not just intellectually, but they wanted to stir them emotionally. And so preaching started to change what they preached, how they preached, how they elicited the response, what they expected, audience participation, the idea of getting the audience involved in the sermon, getting people to come down, getting people to mourn, getting people to wail, the wailing bench, a lot of people call it, or the mourning bench, or come to the altar. They wanted people to do that, and they wanted them to, and, and this really starts to play in to where we're going to go um, as far as a lot of the Oh, like John Raccoon Smith and a lot of the late Restoration guys really had an issue with the mourner's bench, uh, with that philosophy. But that's what they wanted. And so in the first great awakening, that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to get religion to be emotional, more emotional, not just intellectual and not just people sitting and, and listening and then going home. They were trying to elicit an emotional response. And so preaching began to change. Um, and the mode of preaching began to change. And preachers became more emotional and more... We're out of time, but I'm trying to think of the right words. 
I got books of sermons in my in my office by great preachers, Spurgeon and and uh, Charles Spurgeon. We ever heard of him? But these tremendous preachers, Charles Spurgeon and uh, and um, you know Moody uh, in Chicago, a great Baptist preacher, Moody in Chicago, and um, the style of preaching changed. It became more emotional, maybe not the word I'm looking for. It became more uh, topic-driven instead of doctrine-driven, maybe, um, as we see today. Um, we're way out of time. We'll carry a start on this next Wednesday. Sorry we've been dragging. Kind of had to back up, but uh, we'll get into this a little bit. Because I want you to kind of start to see where all these different little groups kind of sprang out of, you know, and how that kind of happened, and then how it kind of gets pulled back. Um, Cane Ridge, and we've got so much stuff to talk about. But, uh, but anyway, we'll get there. Thanks for your time. <laughs>